This week's guest moved to Australia from Ireland in his mid-twenties. He's a former DJ, record store owner, touring agent, and event promoter. It's not people want to support me, Ben. I think it's people want to support what we do and what we're about. I mean, anybody who walks in our office door, they know that like a, a big part of our ethos of the company is to always give back. The universe has been very good to me over the years, and it's just like it's just something that I'll, I'll continue to do as long as I can keep doing it, you know. But then at some point during June or July, maybe you know after after we had this kind of honeymoon period coming out of COVID, people just stopped going out. So it just like fell off the edge of, ticket sales fell off the edge of a cliff in the space of a month. Everything has got so expensive doing bigger events. So therefore you have to put these exorbitant ticket prices on t to even break even. It tends not to happen to people until they're older. So therefore it's hard to get young people to connect with that. So just getting young people aware that we don't have hygiene issues and stuff that can lead to cataracts while you're younger. Give it up for Mike Toner, AKA, Irish Mike. Yeah. <laughs> People want to be part of a winning team. People can find a better version of themselves. If they choose. Hmm. You just need to go start some shit. Action is all that matters. Be a man of your word. I think I look back now and I'm like, whoa, that took some guts. Be kind. Be kind. Be kind. See you at the top. New episode every Wednesday. All right. Oh, hit play. Yeah, I can put the ticker on. How crazy is this? <laughs> We're somewhere different, boys, aren't we? <laughs> away from home, boys. The white shorts, Brucey. <laughs> <laughs> the away shorts on. I don't mind this. It's pretty comfy in here. It's a comfy couch. Oh. I, I walked in late. At the, you know, Bonnie forgot something. <laughs> you forget your head, Bonnie, if I wasn't screwed on. I had to go back and get it, which was all good. All good. Do, do anything for you, Bon. Uh, but yeah, walked in and like, this looks like a comfy. Is, have you, have you couches, is boys? It, why not? Is this your first time? Is this? Yeah. Have you, have you, well, we should. Where, 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 where are we, Benny? You're, you're the one. We're, the, we're at the famous Revolver, which is pretty crazy. But PK, question: Have you been here before? I don't. I've been here once. Today is today the once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You unless, would have to be the only person in Australia. That yeah, well, it been sounds been. like it. unless it was one of those nights, you know, where you just know you're at places, oh, but yeah, you, you don't know where you are. I think you, I think you'd know That's if you're possible. at Revolver. Yeah. Wow, well, I don't know. Like I've, been, I've been in rooms like this. No, nah, not like this, mate. Oh, not this like is this. not yeah, like this. this is one of a kind. I don't think you'd forget that cage. No, you wouldn't forget the cage. Yeah, what don't. happens in... Oh, that's where the DJ goes. Yeah, I gotcha. Mm. It's the famous cage, man. That's crazy. No, no, no. Like I heard about it, know about it, respect it, appreciate it, but no, never been. The country boy from Wang. Has never yeah, been. yeah, yeah. <laughs> never yeah. been to Revolver. Had to get down the highway. I, I, I said to Gemma last night, have you been? <laughs> she's got less chance of going to Revolver than me, but no, she hadn't been either. She hasn't either? No. Claire has. Shout out, Claire. Your <laughs> sister would have been here for sure, dude. I came here on my 18th birthday, actually. Did you? Yeah, bit of initiation. Came it after, what did I do? I think I went to Gurns in the city and then came, rolled into to Revs, which is, uh, that was a good night. Rolled into Revs. Now it looks like a cool giant. And just couches are cool, aren't they? Yeah, how like, sick. I mean, this, that? this it's comfy. Do people fall asleep in there? Yeah, I, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a yes. <laughs> I have, man. And I'm sure I'm not the only these couches, yeah. these couches are famous. Everyone knows how comfy like, they are. I'm, yeah. Imagine, because it sounds like a bit of a, it's a sustained effort at Revs. Is that what we're talking about? It's yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's a long. It's, a, it's open. Yeah, you know, day you, and night. No, you, yeah. you don't come here for some pre-drinks and leave. No, 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 no. no. When you you come and you don't leave. Yeah, <laughs> it's generally you don't leave. So you catch a few Zeds on the couch and, and, you're back and then do fire it again. back up. And fire up. That's it. Love fire it. up. Fire up. Love it, boys. Benny, what's uh? Oh, I've got to share. Actually, before yeah. we get hooked yeah. in, man, I want to shout out my mate Spiz. Spiz, uh, shout out Spiz. He's a legend, man. He hooked us up today with uh with our guest. And um and got us into the famous revolver man. Thanks, Spiz. Good hookup. Thanks, and, Spiz. Yeah. And Spiz, you know what? Actually, talk, speaking of Spiz, how cool is this man? I was talking to him, yeah. and he, he sort of fell into the pod and sort of a little bit late to the party. But he started watching a few. <laughs> started getting it's into not a where few. We start, where we and finish. would you believe, after Dane's episode, branding, painted, he's got a pizza shop, right? Oh. Do addict in North Baldwin, right? Shout out. Yeah, man. Shout out. Best pizzas in Melbourne. He painted his shop pink. <laughs> to stand oh, on the back of Dane. On the back of Dane. That's be, Dane's model. Yeah, to be yeah. different, man. And I've seen a picture of it. I'll, I'll see if I can get it to Bonnie and put it up on the screen. Yeah. It's the mint, man. It looks so yeah. good. And then also... I wonder, it'd be good to... Yeah, anyway. It'd be good, yeah, to get yeah. him, good to get him on a Friends episode to see what He's that did. He's coming on. He's coming on. I've see told what it him. did. See I've if it moved him. the needle. And then and then he he watched another one, uh, the Scott Didier one. And have a guess what he did after the Scott Didier one. Oh, it would have done something like 
higher fire, faster fire. <laughs> higher slow fire, fast. Yeah, something Fired like that. his first employee. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The lessons. Lessons, man. Lessons so from these the little podcasts, fish pod. We're yeah. helping them build this value, business. boys. There's value in what we say. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, get on board. Get on board. Um, <laughs> nah, very good. Very good. Anything else happening, boys? What's the... Well, we've got a new segment and a new intro. That's, uh, we oh, do. The, the way, well, it's well, been sorry, rolling it's, out for a bit now. Out, but we've got, um, we've got, you know, there's some, there's some graphics and to go, to, oh, to go along with that. So <laughs> oh, yeah. we, um, and we'll be tackling that again today, Brucey, no doubt. Of course, there's, there's always a pitch. The, the fish tank, the yeah. fish tank, we well, love. Mate. But um, no, nah, PK had to drive a Bentley that day. He did too. Oh, are you talking about that? Yeah. Yeah. Nah, nice. How'd, uh, how'd that go? In the driving city. the Bentley, yeah, circa six hundred thousand. So if anyone Oof, sees that, as much we as had to house. borrow. We had to borrow it. You know, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, wasn't ours. That, was, that wasn't even the funny part. Remember, we we hired oh, the suits. The suits, the sh- <laughs> suits. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I rolled in my own suit. I thought I looked half half alright. Oh, well, you did. You look good, mate. And then you two blokes rolled in. Well, I hired the suits. <laughs> oh, you know what I did? I'm a bit frugal, so I, I ran in a few oh. joints to hire a couple of suits because I wanted them to be all black. And I only had a charcoal. I think you only had a charcoal as well. And, um, yeah, correct. Black suits aren't. We ended up on, you know, I just Googled like suit hire Collingwood and just rang the top three joints and went with the cheapest one. Turns out the one I went with was a costume shop. Oh, mate. <laughs> and they were a disaster. <laughs> and they were flares and shit, man. Oh, mate. It's like a clown suit. <laughs> it actually but was shout, a clown suit. Shout out our amazing photographer, Bonnie. He's, uh, yeah, if you hang around. Oh, yeah, he's made us look a million. Yeah, bucks. he made us look <laughs> If you hang it's... around in this pod and shoot into oh, Spotify or YouTube and have a look. And it, yeah. Little intro into the segment. Bonnie's made it look like there was no issue at all, and there were big issues. Oh, there was big yeah, issues. They weren't great, but trying to start the car was one of the issues. We're all getting sitting out there of going, yeah, trying well, to too smart for their own good. Yeah, and it was tucked away in a little underground thing and yeah. corners and stuff. But and beeping it, and shit it handled, going. It handled pretty well. Yeah, there wasn't much space in the back. Notice, you know, when we, <laughs> when, do you remember we pulled out in the Bentley? You and me are in the back. Oh, no, I was in the front. Yeah. And we pulled out. What's the, what's that? The tan where they all run around? And we yeah, got yeah. stuck at the lights and there was that yeah. nice fair lady and she started, because we are in the Bentley, she started gazing in and saying, oh, oh it's PK the light. Bruce, yeah, it's getting... <laughs> Bruce, he was like, get out, boys. Get me on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, tan's my area. So, oh, I love trotting around there. That is your school. <laughs> nah, but it's good. It's a good segment. It's a good intro. And yeah, it was nice. Man, nice, today's nice, guest, nice to aspire please. towards a Bentley. I don't know if... Oh, oh man, flavor. 600 on a car. Oh, Come on, please. You could, you could do a lot with 600. You, you can do, do a lot with 600. 600. Yeah. It's a nice car, if but... If you've got it. If you've got it. Yeah, 100%. I feel like I could buy an AMG and have 350,000 left over Is to that? do mm. something else with. But anyway, good boys, we've got an awesome guest sitting there waiting, so let's get into it. Welcome back to Australia's number one podcast. We are the little fish and we speak to the big fish about town each and every week. Please make sure you like, subscribe, drop us a comment interact we've got brucey there ready to take any comments <laughs> yeah. get around him um but yeah please guys it means a lot jump on do the five stars on the the spotify's and the youtubes and all that sort of stuff you want to um, share this one to a mate i reckon man this one well this, this one's yeah well by the sounds of it you know people have shared some amazing times in here so you should you should be sharing share it some to stories those in the comments <laughs> or, <laughs> don't. Some, yeah, or don't, don't. Yeah. Yeah. anonymous oh, comments 100 percent. anonymous shared comments of what happened in these great walls in between. In between. Love it. All right, boys. This week's guest moved to Australia from Ireland in his mid-20s. He's a former DJ, record store owner, touring agent, and event promoter. And he's responsible for some of the craziest parties Woo-hoo, Australia's sure. ever seen. Fact. In this room. No, 100%. Sure. Not just in this room, no, man, no, but no. facts. All around Australia. Yep. Jeepers. In the process, he's raised over $2.5 million for the Fred Hollows Foundation, boys. So philanthropy high on this guy's list, which is super exciting to dive into. Restoring that, this is restoring that has restored the sight of circa 100,000 people. So changed 100,000 lives. Wow. That's crazy. Like dramatically. That's That's crazy. Yeah, big. That's crazy. He basically holds the keys to Australia's most iconic dance music venue, the legendary. Revolver, come on. <laughs> and this is where we are, boys. That's the infamous cage. Yes. Yes. Which you boys are where, 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 Where's your spot normally around here, Marcus? Where would you say? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, have on, oh, oh, I've got a fucking spot. I've passed Absolutely. myself up on those couches, I reckon. Have you? Yeah, that's my spot, I think. So when I'm when I'm feeling good, I'm, I'm on the side of the cage, man. My, I've probably stood next to Mike before. Yeah, if you, if you, if you, you get, <laughs> and you get I'm, I'm watching, and, just... and then when I'm feeling a bit dusty, I'm in the back room on the side couch against the wall hiding. <laughs> no, okay. That was a few years ago. Couch, couch, cage. Couch, couch, cage. cage, yeah, yeah. Here to raise the vibration... 
a legend of the Melbourne dance music scene and founder of the iconic Thick as Thieves touring and events agency. Give it up for Mike Toner, a.k.a. Irish Mike. Yes. <laughs> Cheers, fellas. How are you, man? Oh, great. What an intro. <laughs> should, uh, should get you guys to write my bios. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who do I owe? Or oh, that's much, me, mate. That's me. Cost me. <laughs> that's probably the best one. Yeah, Thanks right. for having us on. Man, what a treat to be in here, man. Yeah, this is yeah. sick. Well, I actually did 17 hours here on Sunday. so uh, <laughs> I Sick of the joint. I would, I would have been happy, happy to do it somewhere else. <laughs> nah, nah, I love this place and uh, I've got a very long history with it, so... Yeah, it's wow. good. That's fair. And you, you're in 17 hours. Yeah, well, I was working. I was running an event. And normally, me and like my staff split the operational um, side of things over over three of us, three different shifts. But tomorrow, I'm, I mean, Mar Mark and the events girls just gone off on maternity leave. And then uh, one of the other kids phoned in sick. So I, I came in at 7 a.m. and I left at 8.30 and I went for a run. And then I, I came back in at 10 and I stayed till 1.30, and then I went out and did a gym session, and then I came Whoa. back at three o'clock, and then I, I was I was I was here till about midnight. I just took a breather to go to the Peran market to pick up some organic kale, and then uh, yeah, that was pretty much me. Balance, <laughs> it's all about balance. Balance is key, mate. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. It's a 17 hour stint with yeah. a gym and a run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's not too many people who leave a well, revolver for a run. That. There we go. I should I should follow him on Strava. <laughs> yeah. and, and obviously, when I'm in here on Sunday, you know, uh, I mean, you know, we, we do we do this um this charity run that we get like a lot of the young DJs and uh and promoters and, and a lot of the the punters that come here and I find um Sunday evening about eight o'clock. So usually you can get them when they're pretty vulnerable and get them to commit to things that they usually regret later <laughs> in the year. So uh, I'll just run around going, "You look like you need to do a marathon next year," and they're like, Sorry, "Oh yeah, sign me up." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. do it now. Yeah, yeah. They wake up in the morning, go I with a wristband. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Uh, uh, Mike, thanks so much for your time. Um, you know, and that intro, that's all facts from you, man. So don't. Uh, <laughs> there's no juice on there. They're just numbers. It sounds like you're doing some amazing, some amazing things, which we want to get into today, but. Can you can you tell us you know who is who is Mike Toner you know you moved to your mid twenties but can you talk about you know can you build the character out yeah for our, for yeah our community? well like yeah I came here I, I, I grew up in Ireland till I was there till I was eighteen then I, I went to university in Glasgow in Scotland and while I was there I started DJing just as a hobby with a bunch of my mates and you know we started running a few small boat parties and stuff ourselves but it was just more like just something for us to do. And um, I decided I wanted to, after I finished my postgrad, I decided I wanted to do a year in Australia. So a couple of my mates said to me, you should take your records out there with you. You know, there's like, it's, apparently it's popping off out there. So I took a, a bag of records with me and first weekend I got here, I ended up in here and I was just like blown away. What, like, cause you know, in Glasgow and in, in Ireland, licensing laws, everything finishes at 3 a.m. And I'm here at midday the next day in the Sunday <laughs> going like, what, is this place going to close? But <laughs> had, had a ball and then just, yeah, started coming down every week, made, made good friends with Boogs, who was like the regular on Sunday morning. And Was he DJing back then? Or yeah, he, man, yeah, he's, he, he's, been, he's been here, he's, I think he started in what year 2000, was that? 2000, yeah, 2000, yeah, or right. even 99 he might have started. But yeah, he actually, um, and, and then so um, I, went to, I went to an after party after a, a revolver session one one weekend and um the guy said to me can you jump on the decks and i was like yeah no worries i started playing for a bit had my records with me and then boogs turned up at this after party and he said let's play back to back for a bit <clears throat> we did that for a while and then he said do you want to come in and play at revolver and i was like what <laughs> like and then so that was he gave me a gig and that was exactly 20 years ago this weekend coming Oh, and uh, oh yeah, my. yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm playing the Sunday. Uh, yeah, like, I, I still play once a month. But yeah. Epic. Oh, so you? Are, I was going to say because I, I put in that you were retired. No, 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 I'm not. Still, still, still. still dust, once a month. Dust them off can every you, once can you a month. Us out yeah, for yeah, Sunday yeah. morning. What's that? Can you sort us out for Sunday? Yeah, yeah, I'll be, I'll be <laughs> in the list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, 20 years ago. Won't exactly. see Marcus on Monday. <laughs> yeah, so. There we go, yeah. Right. Got the signal prepared. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, um, yeah, that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. So you come across here, nothing to your name for a year. The plan was yeah, a year. Yeah, I started, I was on a work and holiday visa. Like, literally said to everybody, I'll be back in a year. Yeah. And uh, I walked into, uh, I was, I started buying records every week in this record shop because, you know, I was always into buying records and stuff. And, um, yeah, I ended up getting a job in the record shop with a couple of great people, Jeanette and Frosty and Jimmy. And um, long story short, we ended up, the, the owner of the record shop got really sick and we ended up kind of going together and taking over the record shop from him. And this record shop was like 
it was really popping off for the first three or four years. And then iTunes and, and Beatport both kicked in and record sales just fell through the floor. So mm -hmm. me and Frosty, one of the guys, we started running events to kind of like supplement the income for the record shop. And I, I was on a, I was sponsored by the record shop to stay in Australia. So if the record shop went under, I was going to have to leave. Uh, so um, yeah, me, me, we just started going gung ho at like events and we started bringing some artists into tour. And then I think it was like 2008 or 2009, we just made a decision that the retail store wasn't going to, there was no, nobody was buying records anymore. Mm. So kind of went our separate ways. And um, I'm still very good friends with those guys, but I went out my own started Thick as Thieves uh, touring an events company. And yeah, like 15 years later here or 14 years later, still going. That's crazy. Two, two questions. What record store was it? Uh, uh, so the original name was Central Station when we took it over. Oh, you yeah, know? Yeah, 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 I yeah. remember. Yeah, yeah. And then, and, the then, and then that was like a franchise. So we dropped the franchise and it was, it was called Here Now Then. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So that was it. And is that how you first made the connections with the artists that you were able to tour? No, I actually had some of the connections from Glasgow already. Um, there was a few artists that were like touring internationally from Glasgow. So I brought them over, over here. And, and bizarrely, some of the guys that I brought over in my first tours were like 2008. I still, I still bring them to Australia quite regularly. There's a, an act from Glasgow called Optimo that I still, they, they play like Meredith Music Festival and played Pitch Festival and stuff like that even up, up until recently so yeah, right. yeah but you know st started just touring some artists that we had originally had a connection with and then <clears throat> i noticed w when i set up the company we, we had done a few events ourselves where we had gone to other touring agencies and they were bringing out an artist so we just bought the artist off them and we started to see this pattern where where it was like the artists would come out here with these big agencies but they would just like they would throw them into a hotel and nobody would, they wouldn't see anybody for a week and then just the promoter would pick them up on the night of the gig. And, and I would always say like, you know, how's, how's Australia been? They were like, oh, we haven't really seen anything since, except for the inside of the hotel room. And I went like, man, you you guys are coming to the best city in the world, Melbourne. Like there's, you, you so just decided like I was going to, you know, start bringing artists out here and really show them the Australian experience and show them everything this country has to offer. And, we started doing that and you know you combine just showing them a great time and like showing them just simple stuff like walking around melbourne cbd all the laneways or are taking them out to healesville animal sanctuary to see the kangaroos and the koalas like i don't know what it is about german techno djs but they get them, <laughs> they, they, they get the pet a koala and all of a sudden you're, you're, you've got them for life you know yeah. so um yeah just started just started um you, you know making sure artists had a really amazing experience in australia and then they would go back and they'd say to their friends other artists who were on the touring circuit you know we went to australia with these guys and they really showed us a good time so that then that hit us up saying we'll come with you guys yeah. and it just it just mushroomed really quickly you know and i think it was 2000 and 2009 we brought we well, brought nine artists to australia and then the year before covid we were doing like 100 a year wow. so yeah and we're doing you know lots of events and stuff as well a lot of the artists we would bring to australia the international touring artists um, we, we would run the Melbourne event for them, you know, and yeah, just, and open. then you sell, and then you sell them on interstate, and interstate stuff as well. we sell them on. That's right. You know, yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got great relationships with a lot of the key promoters interstate and some of the other touring companies, if they get a really hot act, they, they want to do all the cities themselves, Yeah. but I'm like, it's, it's kind of shitty to be like selling them all the stuff that, the they, shit, that, yeah, that yeah. needs work. And then when they, when they get a home run you know, like doing it yourself. So I've, I've always, I've got great relationships with all the guys under state and yeah, it's worked out well for us, you know. From a, Mike, from a, I'm probably coming a little bit further back from Ben, from, from Benny, but you know, from a business perspective, you start Thick as Thieves. How do you, you know, how, do, how does it monetize and how, how do you, like, it sounds like you're putting on these amazing gigs. Do you bankroll it from a, from the start? Yeah. And then do you have to sell tickets and then you go, Hey, let's get some, let's get some acts in and we'll pay you, but I haven't sold the tickets yet, but I'll, you know, how yeah, does, how yeah. does that work? Yeah. I mean, the thing is I, I've always been very, very careful with like not trying to do too much too quickly, Peter, you know, like there's, I mean, I, I've heard some stories recently. There was a festival last year where these guys literally like tried to run this festival and they all, they all put their houses down as security and they all ended up losing them, oh, you know? And, and like, whereas I, I've like, I've had very slow growth, just, a little bit bigger every year, but not not trying to take on anything that was going to leave me in that kind of trouble, you know. So, um, yeah, and, and and now a lot of the ticketing companies will, <clears throat> they're all competing for your business. So they'll say if you sign with us, 
we'll give you an advance. You know, if you sell 30% of the tickets in the first day, we'll release 80% of that money so you can then pay the artists and fund the events, you know, so, yeah. So there's little hacks. There's hacks, yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, 100%. And, and early on, Mike, the, the biggest challenge I would have thought would have been how, how did you know who to bring and you know, and be, be confident that because that that's probably the biggest gamble, was it? Like, yeah. Well, well, luckily when when I started touring, Ben, we were we were um I was working in a record shop, so I could see what was flying off the shelves on the okay, records. Okay, gotcha. And you you could see, it was almost like we had this six month jump because you could see what art what records were selling really well. Then they'd and, start playing them. Yeah. Exactly. You, you you get you see something flying off the shelves in the record store. You know, three months time the public are going to be onto it. So if we had that window to try and get ahead and start securing some of these acts. So and how did yeah. you how did you market those events before social media was obviously like? Oh man, it was, yeah, I have this conversation with people a, a bit. Like it was literally like you know, like flyers putting up posters. Like y y young kids used to come and say to us, like, "Can I get a gig for you?" And you'd say, "There's a thousand flyers. We'll put <laughs> them in the car and car under the car wipers, stuff like yeah. that." There, you know on Chapel Street on a Saturday night. So it was, I mean, it was completely different, you know. And you had like, all the little promoters back in the day. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I remember because we ran a few cl clubs myself back yeah, in the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we used to have, yeah, the, the young promoters that wanted to DJ or wanted to get involved, you'd have like promoter meetings. They'd come in and you'd set targets or whatever. That's and, right. And they'd literally go and bring in their mates. and they give get, them $2 per head. Yeah, $2 per head. There was always- pisses little, they could drink as well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So Whereas, that that was the oh yeah nowadays obviously it's all just through Facebook and Instagram digital and yeah totally and, 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 and TikTok TikTok's become the yeah. the the sleeping giant like yeah. you know I mean it's obviously such a massive platform now but there's these artists that you can I I had a, a young guy here this weekend and we had like it was like the biggest revolver day show that we've ever had what and and for a day party and he's like he's not got a big Instagram following he's he's not got um massive Spotify plays, which is two metrics we usually look for, but he's massive on TikTok. And it, it, like, it, it blew us away how, how popular he was. Like, if, yeah. So how I've been, how is that possible? I came to a late night tough guy gig here during the day yeah. and literally people were hanging from the ceiling. Yeah, 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 so yeah. I remember that one. That, 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 that was one of the other, the other. That was epic, that. Big that ones, was, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. But I mean, th this was like, yeah, 30% more people. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. And that's on the back of TikTok. TikTok, yeah, it's becoming there, there's actually this specific genre now called TikTok techno and it's like <laughs> it's like all these all these um artists playing this really hard fast music but like the kids just eat it up. Oh, they love it, you know. Yeah. There's one sick, there's one, there's one sick, <laughs> guilty. Yeah, totally, totally. And and you know, it's good cuz like it's like that genre of music is probably appeals to like 18 to 24 year olds, but what happens is then they follow that for a while, but then their their music taste evolves. softens, evolves, yeah. and then and then they get into some of the more refined stuff. Well, and they see books, don't yeah, they? Yeah, <laughs> they see books and they go, "Oh, yeah, I see what's going that, that, on." That's over exactly here. right. That's exactly right. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, TikTok's a big one now. On that, on the the um, you know. You guys have been around for so long and have been like the, at the forefront and the tastemakers, I would argue, in, in not just in Melbourne, but in Australia. How has the, how have the genres, would you say, evolved or have they not evolved oh, too much? I mean, the, the, like the, the dev, look, look it, it's like anything. It, it comes in cycles, you know. It's like you, you tend to find what, what happens is um, you'll, you'll get, so, so say, for example, this, this music, it's really hard and fast now. I subscribe to a bunch of promo lists and I noticed that, that this hard fast music has become really popular quite quickly. So what you, what I noticed was Calvin Harris has just released a record now and it's like 140 or 145 oh. BPM. That to me now says that in probably six to 12 months time, the cool kids will start to go, oh, you know what, if Calvin Harris is doing it, I need to go the other way. And then it'll start to evolve into, there'll be, there'll be something that's probably a bit more mellow. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you remember, Ben, like, say, for example, 2014 to 2017, it was all, like, deep house, yeah. super slow, yeah. like, you know, and, but then the big commercial acts start make, doing that kind of music, and then when they're doing it, the cool they kids go, opposite. oh, we want to go the opposite direction. So, yeah, it, it just, it goes in cycles, but I always think as well, it doesn't ever revert back to something that's been before. It becomes a new like this this particular brand of techno that's really big right now is not like 
pre-existing techno. So I, I spoke to these guys the other week um, who run this festival in Scotland called Terminal V, and they had um they had a uh, uh, two massive big artists on at the same time. I'll not name them, but like one of them was a real heritage, massively famous um, techno name that that you would recognize for sure. And on the other stage, there was like one of these new type of TikTok techno acts. And when the old legendary heritage guy was playing, there was 300 people at the stage and the other kid had 7,000 at a stage. What? Yeah. yeah. And, the, and, the, and the heritage guy was on the main stage, was he? Yeah, or? yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. So, so I think what'll happen is there'll be a switch over to something that's a bit more gentle, but it'll, it'll be something new as well. And, and, so, and is, is that a gamble for you to figure that, to stay on the cutting edge and two of these guys, like you're saying, you were a bit surprised with the guy on the weekend. Yeah, yeah. Normal metrics. You didn't go off the normal metrics. Yeah. Is there a little? Is that where the little bit of risk you, you, lies? You, yeah. Look, it's a, it's a bit risky, but you you can kind of you know if you follow a lot of, um, you know you, we we keep our eye on the music scene all the time in general, and you can you can kind of feel it's coming, and you know you, like some of the local kids as well, like. You know, there's there's a local kid from Melbourne called Stoom. That's I'm seeing that, him on Friday night. Oh, you're seeing him on Friday night. <laughs> really, really. I mean, I mean, I mean, he's just he's become a rock star now. Yeah. He's just selling out everything he does. So you, you can kind of see when you start seeing some of the local guys pushing a particular sound, and all of a sudden they'll play a gig in their hometown and it'll sell out 15 other tickets. You go, it makes you hone in and go, what's going on what's here? Going, you know, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you it's gotta, crazy. Got to keep your eyes and ears yeah. open. Where, where, to what's where are you going seeing on? Stoom on Friday? I think it's at Billboards. Oh, Billboards. Yeah, 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 actually, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That, 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 the, the guy Mark who I had out last weekend, he played 170 two or three weeks ago and sold it out five weeks in advance. And then yeah. we did another show here in Revolver in the weekend and yeah. sold it out again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. crazy. Fuck, people just love it. Do love you know, it. I'm seeing um, this bloke BLK. I think uh, he's Irish. Hey, right. I'll let you into something. You know, I was talking about those two acts there, and yeah, yeah, I had yeah. a feeling it was <laughs> BLK was the one that drew all the people. Oh, I had a feeling it was going to be. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm feeling old, man. Ah. <laughs> Spears, what's going on, dude? Like, because I'm normally finger on the pulse, but I've been on this. Well, Ben, from what you told me off off air, this, this could be your genre. This could be time for your <laughs> yeah, your, your oh, return. 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 Oh, return. Yeah, yeah, Benny. true. Well, I used to. Yeah, back in the day, we had we were more the hard house and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. On that that train, and then. Um, for me, I like I like the I like house progressive. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. I love you know the the journey Jacob and yeah, all those, yeah, all awesome, those boys, great, man. man. I'm yeah. a I'm a thick as thieves guy. Yeah, they're legends, man. Man yeah. and him, super flu. Yeah, I love it, man. Yeah. That, that's 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 so that's up my alley. Yeah. That's the shit. That's my shit, man. Good, 100%. good, good. Yeah, and, good. and you've done some sick. I've actually I've got to ask you one of those parties. One of the rainbow set. Yeah, the first rainbow. We've got to talk about that. So. How did that come about? Well, well sorry, which rainbow? The, the first rainbow, the first when you took over the market stage. Well, yeah, look, you know, it, well, it was quite organic. We we um we just started like I just started selling acts to Rainbow and and building a relationship with him, and then Thad, the previous booker there, we just had a great relationship, and and um it it, it wasn't ever like an official takeover. It was just like the stuff that we were doing at that time really resonated with what Rainbow were doing, and yeah. you know, it just became you know they knew that I would go in and go say to the artist that this is something you have to do. You know, it doesn't matter if you're getting offered better money elsewhere, like rainbow. So iconic. And it's such, it's, it's, it was the best festival in Australia at the time. You know, there's, there's talk about it making a comeback, but, um, but yeah, there, there was a stage there for a couple of years, literally in the market stage on like Sunday and Monday. It was oh, like dude. 80% of our acts. You know? I was there, man. <laughs> those, those, to those woods to a, I went to Rainbow maybe 15 years yeah. running, I reckon. And all the two years that stick out were Super Flu. And him. And him. Yeah. Uh, late Night Tough late Guy. Late Night Tough Guy, that's right. And then I think uh, Patrick Topping one yeah. year. Where Patrick, he was, yeah. yeah, Patrick was like... I've watched that on YouTube a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was one of... That was an epic set. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that comes on, on the TV. Anyway, anyway right. enough of the parties. Let's <laughs> get into the business and get PK back <laughs> into the... Lost. Get PK back into the... Com- oh, man, I no, love it. No, it's nice. It's nice. This is a treat, man. This is a treat, Um, Mike, I guess... What are, what are the challenges that that running a business like this? What have you ran into? Like COVID sticks out as a big I mean, one that would yeah. have, would have floored you guys and floored well, well, your industry. Well, do, do, do you know what, Peter? Like COVID was actually okay when it was happening because, like you know, like the businesses, the government were pretty good in funding and giving yeah. your staff, you know, payments while we were off and stuff. The the big challenge came when we came back because there was this um there was this period where when we reopened. 
everybody went out all the time for like three or four months and it created this massive false economy where everybody then thought that this was what it was going to be like. So, you know, we, we, we re-emerged after Omicron and like around the end of Feb last year. So we, 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 had, we had a massive show, like a, we, we were looking for eight to 10,000 people that was supposed to be mid-Feb that we had to cancel. Uh-huh. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, the, when you cancel those, a bit of a kick in the fucking nuts, you know, because like, you know, you lay, you lay out a lot of money on marketing and all that kind of stuff already. And then um, co- we reopened after COVID and it was like just even doing local stuff was hugely successful. Probably we had a month or two of people bringing international talent here and the shows all went gangbusters. And in that time period, all the festivals and all the bookers in Australia just went nuts booking stuff for what is now just the summer we've just passed. But then at some point during June or July, maybe, you know, after after we had this kind of honeymoon period coming out of COVID, people just stopped going out. So it just like fell off the edge of, ticket sales fell off the edge of a cliff in the space of a month. Yeah. And all these big festivals and promoters and everything had committed to paying these exorbitant fees because they were all competing against each other yeah. to try and get these artists to come out and like, November, December, January, February gone, and like loads of the festivals did their balls this summer. Like a lot, a lot of them aren't coming back. Like, you know, I, mean, I don't know if you saw Falls announced that they're mm. they're done. They, they've been going like I think 20, twenty something yeah. years. Yeah, they, 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 yeah. They, they didn't announce that they're done. They said they're taking a breather. But you know, is that is well, that because know, they outlaid so much money and just didn't recoup? It look, I, I don't know the ins and outs of it. Like they they, they were a four day camping festival. Yeah. Um, they had some issues with their site. They ended up moving to the Sydney Meyer Music Bowl. But even then, you know, it's not, um, it's, it's just look, not the look, same. Look, yeah. I'll give you a hypothetical situation. They they booked an artist who played at the Sydney Meyer Music Bowl coming out of COVID, and I think it was like March. And and this female artist Peggy Goo did like 13,000 oh, yeah, 13, should... people on her own. Falls comes around a year, like December. Mm-hmm. They had because they had her booked for the festival, but then they moved it to the bowl, and they had her on the lineup again with ten other big acts on the same day, and they didn't even do half the numbers, or they probably did about half of what she did on her own eight months earlier. So, like, I mean, and that that was no fault of the promoters; that was just the market, it's just, just impossible. It yeah, just, it just imploded like in a short space of time. So, so what's the thickest these doing differently? To be able to, you know, you're still here. You're yeah, still yeah. Hosting the parties that are heaving at revs on a Sunday. Yeah. Right? Look again, you know, a lot of it comes down to like, you know, with any business managing your risk and not, you know, like not biting off more than you can chew. And um, yeah, like luckily we got out of the, we came out of the summer. We we, we did four or five big shows. <clears throat> Truth be told, if I put the 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 profit and loss for all them beside each other, we exactly broke even on the big shows. There was a couple of them took really big hits and a couple of them did well. Um, but you know, there's other facets to the business tour, international touring. A lot of the smaller shows actually did really well. So this year going forward, I think, you know, you've got all these circumstances, which you guys will be across like rising interest rates, cost of living, cost, cost of labor, cost of equipment. Everything has got so expensive doing bigger events. So therefore you have to put these exorbitant ticket prices on t- to even break even. Yeah. So we're we've just kind of reassessed and gone back and gone. People don't. The kids haven't got 150 bucks to spend on a ticket now, and then everything else that comes along with that day, they want to spend 30 or 40 bucks on a club. So we're just back doing more heaps and heaps of smaller shows and like cheaper ticket price. You know, seeing one act instead of seeing five. So yeah, you just got to evolve the business. And, you know, yeah. How hard, how hard has that been to do, Mike? Because I'd imagine you guys like. You guys have ridden a wave that, what, how long, 10, 10 12? Well, really yeah, long? Thick as Eve, I started in 2009, so 14 years. 14 now. years you guys have been at the top of the game and, and there's been, you know, the Melbourne scene has popped yeah. you know, many, many times Me- Mel- over that Melbourne, journey. Melbourne, Ben, is one of the cities where all the international artists, love it. they're, they're just like, you've got to go there. It's, yeah. it's like this, it's just amazing. You know, all the artists look at, they have amazing weather, they were getting good fees, they come out here, a lot of them come between November and, and March, and then, they, you know, they do the European or US festival season. But, like, you know, Aust- Australia was this real, like, like golden hot pot to come here and tour. But I- I'm feeling this year that because last year, because a lot of the gigs didn't go that well, you add into the fact November, December, just pissed rain the whole fucking two oh, months. Yeah, uh, did. We, 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 we did a gig on at, a, do you know, Riva in Melbourne? Yeah, I've been, I've been to. Yeah, I've been to Riva. Yeah. And 
it was on like the third weekend November because there's a festival in Sydney called Harbour Life that we always team up with yeah. and we always share acts, you know. And um, every year we've done an event on that time period. It's been like between 25 and 30 degrees and sunny. We did an event this this year. We did Clapton at, um, at Riva and it was literally like hailstoning blowing oh. a gale <laughs> like yeah we, we had to get clapped on because he finished at, and at harbor life and he, he was on a on a private jet and and I, I, like i was with him and the guy from the jet was basically like we're not going to be able to land this thing because of the weather and, and and i was like mate we've got to get this gig and he was just like boys look strap in what, what, <laughs> what, I'm, what i'm about to do is not really <laughs> that safe that safe but just if you're prepared for a few bumps and we were just like it was like been in this can of sardines you know and like i don't want to sound like a wanker talking about a private jet but it was just like <laughs> it was it was just literally like like it was just like this thing was just beating off the ground as we were trying to land and we, we we got him in and like got him in a car and got him here just like with a minute to spare but it was like when he went up and played like the rain was just sideways so you know, a lot of the big artists are kind of they 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 look at this footage and go like, ah, oh, do we want to go to Australia yeah. this year? You know, and, uh -huh. and and like and like the promoters have all had to drop their fees and their offers, and rightly so because they all took a massive haircut last year. So, oh, I'm feeling that like Australia is nowhere near the priority level for international tour and artists this year is what it was like and before COVID. They'll 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 come back. But what what I was gonna ask, Mike, was. How have you stopped yourself? Because you were saying it's all about managing risk, and I feel like the key, one of the keys to the, to your success is, you, you know, most people get greedy. You know what yeah, I mean? You yeah. get greedy and you get caught, right? Yeah. So when you're putting on these big parties and you're filling them up and and you, and and they're all going great, like you said, these other young guys then go, oh, I'm going to go bigger and bigger yeah, and yeah, bigger, yeah. and that's when you get caught out. Yeah. How for 14 years when you guys are hot and you know that there's been I'm, I'm sure there's been times where you know you could have filled them yeah but you've, but you've decided not to yeah i've got this quote that warren buffett said stuck up in my on my on my room and it says never risk something you do have and you do need for something you don't have and you don't need so while i've been making decisions on you know like i told you the story these these guys who ran this festival like they put their houses in their line some of them have got kids and they lost them and like like a few of those guys had already existing good businesses yeah. and because of the reputation damage from the festival that they, they lost their other businesses and and i mean there's there's been a few stories of guys that have run festivals around melbourne this this summer just gone and and like you know they might have been working in the industry for 10 years and they'll just never be able to work in the industry again because they tried to go too big too quickly and it backfired so you know just like not not biting off more than you can chew you know just being a being being a bit more cautious with your expectation is just something that served me well over over the long term you know it's a secret weapon because it's i feel lesson, like man, man. it, it is such lesson. a secret weapon in business and it's a good business advice to anyone because i reckon we learned that a little bit early on growing our business that yeah 100 you know we actually were talking before we came on we had a one project you know where we're yeah. in the development space and there was one project early on that we lost money on it's the only project to this day but it was a significant amount and you look back and you go, but Pete, what, what did you say before we came on? You're like, we'd be running around net today thinking we we're bulletproof. That's right. If that yeah, didn't yeah, happen yeah. and yeah. setting ourselves up for a big they're the, they're the Yeah, they're the proper lessons. And as long as you can get a little bit burnt, but then, yeah. you know, you go, live to fight another day. <laughs> yeah. Live to fight another day. I That's think right. it definitely sets you up. And especially when you're early on, I feel like those, the stakes are always a bit smaller because yeah. if you do, you know, tick along and grow, grow whatever you're doing, the, the stakes get high. Absolutely. And, and, Absolutely. And, if you, and if you slip up on something big um, and maybe going against the quote, from, yeah, yeah. From, from Warren Buffett, then you can lose everything That's and, right. and it can be really hard to come back. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Mike, can yeah. you talk to us about like the, the setting up? Because how many employees have you got now? I've got like six on the books, but, you know, two are part-time. So, yeah, like, um, yeah, I've got like full-time head of events and marketing, got two touring agents, got uh, two people that run, we have a domestic agency, so we look after about nine or ten local artists, um, got a record label, so yeah, so you got a bit going on. So yeah, so, how, going on. so how do you, you know, like when you um like when you when you were growing the business, talk us through that stage of knowing when to put on the first employee and how yeah. big, how big of a risk was that? Yeah, were you well, working from home? Well. Do you get an office? Like talk us through that the growing pains of because I know like most small businesses it's sort of you find yourself in a position where you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Yeah. You need it, but you can't really afford it yeah. or you're a bit worried or whatever. Did you have to go through that sort of oh, transition? Absolutely. Yeah, so um, I 
so when I started, I was like one man band and I was like trying to like, you know, I think this is a bit of a common characteristic where sometimes you get people that are really good at like networking and talking the phone, doing deals. And that, that was me. But when it comes to organization and admin work, I'm an absolute fucking disaster, <laughs> like, like painful. Like, so I've just been over the, over the years, I've just always put people around me that are good at that stuff to kind of pick up my mess, you know, but I was living with one of my best friends, Jess. Um, when I was, we were sharing an apartment up in North Melbourne for the first few years, I had thick as thieves and she would hear me on the phone and I'd have like sent the artist to the wrong airport and I'd have like booked them in the wrong hotel. And she just kind of said like, get out of the way and let me handle this. And like literally 10 years later now, she's got a full company doing operations for logistics for artists and visa processing and booking all for like 10 other touring companies like myself. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it just started out of her kind of taking Helping over. You, yeah. So so she she came along and started helping me, and that was like, I said to her, "Would you would you pick up a few hours doing this part time?" And then she became full time, and then you know, and then I took on one of my really close mates, Demo. We were DJing together for a while, um, and Demo was running at events at a. Do you know? Do you remember a place, a Wawa Lounge? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Da and Damon Walsh. Yeah, yeah Damon yeah, Walsh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, we were, we, Demo was running the events up there and, you know, I, I was at the stage where I was running events here but knew that I kind of wanted to focus more time on touring and also we had a couple of good acts that I'd like, you know, that I'd found early and kind of worked with and you could see that these acts had the capacity to go to bigger venues. So, you know, like Patrick Topping and Clapton and people like MK and, you know, we'd done like revolver shows and then you kind of move up from revolver to go to maybe somewhere like Brown Alley or, or the bottom end that's got like, instead of having like an 800 capacity, it's got a 1500. And then, but then you want to jump, the next jump from that is going to something like Riva. So you're going from 1500 to 5000. 5000, yeah. And, and, but you know, the, the outlay on that's, you know, you're, you're 3000, you're break even. So like you're kind of hearts in your mouth, but anyway, Demo came on board and he, he, he was just a gun at events and we managed to scale up kind of, relatively like a few bumpy rides along the way but like um for the most part it, it, the transition was pretty smooth and then you know the, doing the regular events you know you, you learn your systems you get them in place and yeah just just kind of it, it happened like quite organically so demo came on board and started do, doing the events um I, you know got tamara and now demo has subsequently gone on and set up his own um digital media marketing agency but we still work very closely together he consults for me and um Tamara, who was working under him, took the role of head of events um, and marketing. And then I've got like a girl, Jemima and, and TC look after the domestic agency. So yeah, it, it was it was all very slow and organic. You know, this is all over a 15 yeah. year period. And it, like a team of seven or eight, it's not that big, you know? So it, it was all just like little additions when we needed them, you know? But uh, we've, got, we've got a great team and a great work environment, you know? And yeah, and the local DJs, you've got a tight little crew yeah, of some of the best yeah. DJs, man. Yeah. I, could, I could imagine... Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I reckon you would have them lined up down bloody Chapel Street to be part of your agency. Yeah. Uh, and you've kept it, you've yeah. just kept it pure for however many years. Absolutely. Is there, how many, what, five or six? No, we, we, well, yeah, six. And I've actually just taken on another three. Um, there's there's a there's a girl that, she used to be really big back in the minimal days under the name Keish, but she's, she, she just got out of the DJ scene and just come back in and, um, uh, on her real name Alicia she's doing really cool music and stuff and I just see something there and I thought I've got to give this a go and then we've actually got a young guy who I've just taken on who's got like cerebral palsy and it, like you know he's, he's he's physically quite um quite impaired but he's a fucking brilliant DJ and he yeah, lives shit. for it he yeah. absolutely lives for it and, and he's just like his name's Cooper Smith and he's like he played on the main stage at like Ability Fest recently and you know he, he's just but anyway I, um he works with he does some music stuff with tom evans who's jacob's part yeah, of the journey tom, yeah 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 you know tom yeah, oh, yeah. i don't personally but i know yeah, who he is yeah yeah, yeah yeah and um and tom came and said to me mike you should check out this kid and as soon as i saw him i was like i, I hit oh, up his bullshit, mom and i was like yeah. I, I want to represent him he's just he's a he's an absolute legend and i, I see a big big future for him and I, already like i just sent out a few emails and everybody wants to book him yeah he's, he's great wow. yeah because you you've kept it pretty tight over many, yeah many yeah we've right? a real family you know like we uh, we tend i tend not to take on more artists because you know I do, I, i'd rather kind of deliver quality for the people i've got you know for the acts i've got rather than just you know 
an agency with 50 acts and you're getting them a gig every two weeks, you know? Yeah. So you've spent sort of the last, what is it, 14 years just building this business as well and all while you're doing this, you've got this whole philanthropy on the side as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, the philanthropy, yeah. I think, I, d I don't know if, I've, if you've looked into the backstory, but when I was 18 years old, I was at college in, um, in Ireland and I, w I just witnessed this thing one time. Where, so there was a guy who was like an albino that was really short-sighted. I used to see him around the college and um, there was like a floating staircase, you know, like you would imagine was in a prison, you know, in the middle of the floor it goes up and then it went over and up again. And I saw him rushing to a class one day and he didn't see the floating staircase and he just smashed his head off it, dropped all his books, cut his head. And then there was these guys beside it and they started laughing at him. The guy hit the deck and I ran over to him and I was like, fuck me, are you all right? Like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And like, I went over and gave these guys an absolute spray, called them like piece of shit for laughing at the guy. And I went home that night and, and it really affected me. Like I, like I literally had a breakdown and I was like, I made a decision. I, w I wanted to try and um, try and devote some of my life to helping people with impaired vision. So um, when I set up the company, um, I looked into it and I started. It was me and Boogs at the start, and I went and approached the Guide Dogs Association. I said, "Look, I'm setting up this company. I'd like to start maybe doing some events." So we did a couple of events for the Guide Dogs Association, um, raised some money, just local stuff. And then I was just literally driving down Pont Road one day and I saw this huge sign saying $25 to restore the gift of sight. And I was like, what the fuck is that? Like, So I looked into it and it was the Fred Hollis Foundation. And um, I basically walked into their office and I said to them, look, you know, I, I run this music events company and, you know, I'd like to try and raise some money for it. And they said, how do you propose doing that? And I said, like, you know, well, I, I run music events at Revolver. They subsequently told me, like, five years later after I've been working for them a while, they were like, they were like, who the fuck is this tripper? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> running rhymes to the rain. Like, this this <laughs> raver, like, you know, coming in, like, thinking he's going to... And so there was normal protocol with a lot of the a lot of the um, touring companies. If they bring an artist out to Australia, if they put on a show and the show sells out, they immediately go back to their management and go, let's do another show. You'll make more money. We'll make more money. And I just decided to take a bit of a different approach. So I, th I thought if we do a show and the show sold out, I'll approach the artist and say would you give up two hours of your time to play for free? I'll resource the show. I'll use my team to market it, do all that. And every cent that comes through the door, we'll give to the Fred Hollis Foundation. So luckily, like we did the first show with Clapton and I think we went pretty well. We raised like about 20 or 30 grand. You know, we got like, you know, a thousand people and we always charge $25 because... Entry cash? Uh, 25, not 20, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah $25, $25 to restore the store, get, get the yeah. site. So yeah. and then we used ah. to give people a little thing saying you know, congratulations, you've just restored the sight of one person. Oh, that's neat. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's smart. Yeah, and then, um, and then you know, so we did it, and then a few of the, like we did, we did Clapton, and then Patrick Topping, and Kolsch, and a few of the other big DJs that we were touring, all, because I had great relationships with them, they all committed to doing this, and then all the other acts, um, we, we would do this thing the day after the show, where I've got, Fred Hollis gave me this big, massive white blank check that said, congratulations you've yeah. so so we would go up to the fred hollow's office take the artist up there they'd get a picture taken then they'd post it in their socials saying you, you know we played a show for free last night in melbourne at revolver and we raised 30 grand and then like their socials would go nuts and everybody would say my god you know this is incredible well done so they were getting a real good feel good factor out of the fact that they made a real contribution when they came to melbourne and then I started getting lots of other artists going, hey, I want to do one of these shows. And it just snowballed. So we, we, we started, um, yeah, the shows became quite regular then. You know, just became this thing where if we if we did a sold out show, I'd automatically ask the artist if they'd do another show and then we'd give all the money to the Fred Hollis Foundation. So you're knocking on to Fred Hollis on a Monday? Uh, yeah, with a cash. Yeah, 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 totally. He's this, he's this fucking guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he, he's a guy who rolled out of revs with a bag of cash and a check. You know? like, so, um, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, Fred Hollis, like, the, you know, I've, I've, I've got such a good relationship with, with Marcus up there who's the key guy I work with and he said, like, he said, "If you only knew the conversations that were going on behind your back about what, <laughs> like, we were like, and to the point where at one point they were like, you know, like this is amazing that, that, that you know they're raising all this money, but like, like what if somebody hap what if something happens where somebody like ODs at one of these events, like Fred Hall is going to be like in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons and stuff like that there, but no, nah, no, nothing's happened, and um, yeah, we've we've built a great relationship, and then and then yeah, it's like, and then obviously the whole 
the running thing came around. Yeah, as well. tell us about that because I've got I've got a couple of blokes here. I reckon that might yeah, sign well, up. You saying Peter off? Yeah, yeah, Peter's in for sure, man. Yeah, how long? What? Yeah. Well, here, here we go. Here we go. So, um. In 2015, uh, me and a couple of mates had done a, a like I've never really been a runner, but we'd done a couple of these, you know, the Tough Mudder events. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. And um, I'd, I'd done a little bit of swimming when I was younger, but anyway, like I, I went to Rainbow Serpent with my with my ex, and we came back and we broke up the day when we came back, and I was just feeling a bit kind of down the dumps, and I, I was like, I was literally heading out to get on the piss with one of my mates, and I walked past a bike shop, and 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 this thing in my head just went, sign up for an Ironman, go and do it. So. I signed up for an Ironman triathlon. I hadn't done a triathlon before. And on man's no, no feet in. No, so no, 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 it's, it's a bit of a long one, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I signed up for this Ironman, <laughs> and then crazy. I was like, you know, I, had, I literally hadn't been on a bike for twenty years, like even cycled a bike. So I started training for this thing, and then you know I was kind of like documenting my journey in social media, and I noticed everybody was just like, "Fucking hell!" You know, this is like it's such a a polar opposite to the, like the industry you're in. <laughs> So I decided, um, I noticed with, with the Ironman, you could actually, um, you could nominate a charity and raise some money. So I thought I'll just, I'll throw up a sponsorship link saying I'm doing this anyway for Fred Hollows. And like, I was just blown away how much support I got. Like, and, and, I, and I was, I was like, holy shit. So I did the Ironman and yeah, raised a significant amount of money. Well, you know, everybody just supported me on it. How much and did then you the, get it? Uh, but probably 35 grand. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just from and donations from friends. Just and donations from club owners and punters that come, you know, we yeah, had come to the events and whatnot. Incredible. Um, and, and look, bear in mind, everybody hit me up for a guest list that whole year. We said, I'll put you in the guest <laughs> list, but here's my link, you know. <laughs> so, um, and then the following year, one of my good mates, Ollie, happened to sign up for an Ironman. I said, throw a link up. And he did that it. That DJ, he, DJ. Ollie Davis. Ollie Davis. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and he did the same thing. So the following year, like, I mean, training for an Ironman, you're training for three sports is like so time consuming. For context, oh man, it's a 3.8k swim, 180k yeah. bike and a marathon. marathon. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So it's a long day out, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Ollie did the same thing. And then, so the following year, we thought it'd be good to do something together, but like, you know, rather than doing an Ironman, we found out that Fred Hollows actually, there was this event called um, Coast Trek that was down the, down the peninsula and you could elect to do a 30 or a 60K run or trek. And the idea was you had to have a team of four. The team had to be mixed between male and females, but, you know, whatever the mix was, that was fine. So we got, like, me and Ollie got one of our other mates, Gaz, and and a girl, Jane, and, and we, we signed up and we did the 60K. So I, I kind of said to the guys, look, I'll take you guys out training to prepare for this thing. So we meet up three or four times a week, go out for a run. Um, and then, you know, we threw a sponsorship link up you know for fred hollows and again like got really well supported the following year a few other mates had said to me like if you're doing that thing again next year let us know the next year we had two teams of four then following year there were six teams of four so we had 24 at this stage yeah. mixed between the 30 and the 60k and then we were heading into 2020 it was year four and like when we when we did it in year three you know we had quite a few like high profile djs did it and they were all documenting their journey as they went along and must have caught people's attention. So I put up a post on social media saying, hey, I've been asked a few times about the run this year. I'm prepared to, you, you, anybody's welcome to join our Thick as Thieves team under the, under the deal that you have to raise a thousand bucks for Fred Hollows. That's like minimum standard. And I woke up the next, I said, train to start next week. And I woke up the next day and I had 120 people all hit me up saying they wanted to be part of it. And I was just like, my God. So that was January, 2020. I started everybody training and, the way it would work is I would take groups of people out running at Albert Park Lake about six in the morning. And, you know, these are all like these <laughs> toe rag DJs and promoters yeah. that like just literally yeah. would roll out of like one six one or revolver in the morning. And they all started, some of them couldn't run 200 meters at the start, but you know, we, we, we started everybody training and then, then that year COVID kicked in. Um, and so the event was supposed to be in May and then it was moved to August um, so during that time period, obviously we had our lockdowns, but we had all these WhatsApp groups and the go. And if you remember, people were allowed to exercise in groups of two. So uh, all our crews were still meeting up at the lake in groups of two and all just running different directions. And you'd be running with a friend. You'd see your, Hey, how are you going? How are you hanging <laughs> yeah. in? And just, it became this real community thing. And because our industry was so locked down, a lot of people were kind of doing it really tough with their mental health. But everybody that was involved in this run said that the run like really helped 
get them through it. Like they were getting physically fit. P people that had been like drinking it and smashing it in the weekend for years, all of a sudden, because the clubs were closed, became like the embodiment of, of, of health, you know? <laughs> so it, it had like, you know, it, there were so many layers to this thing. It was like we were raising money for these people that really needed it. The community were all banded together. People were getting getting fit you know there was there was a lot it was like and it was like this ripple effect where the more people kind of um caught uh, made it visible what they were doing all their people would then want to get involved in it so it's infectious that time stuff. yeah right. totally so then the if you remember it was august 2020 we were still in lockdown that event got cancelled so i i had been literally you know kind of training or like had this group of 120 people who were all prepared to raise a thousand bucks with no event and I happened to bump into one of my old um, buddies, uh, Taz, who was working for City of Port Phillip Council. Me and he was he was in the triathlon club when I was doing my Ironman. And I, and I, I said to him, oh, I'm a bit despondent, man, because I've, I've, I've like I'm on the cusp of something here, but we've got no event. And he said, Run your own event. And I said, What a running event? And he was like, Yeah, it's just the same as a music event. And I was like, well, What are you talking about? And he said. Mate, instead of a stage, you've got a start stop line. Instead of a bar, you've got aid stations. Instead of like, you know, you still need first aid, you still need a permit. So. Started, he said, like, come down to study at Port Phillip. I'll explain to them what you're doing. And, um, and yeah, we did that. So so we created our own event that year because we had so much momentum going. So the 120 people all, instead of, like, they all kept training the whole year. We just start, luckily, we just came out of lockdown. I think it was, like, the start of November. And we ran our event at the start of December. So between the 120 people, we raised, like, 250 grand. And then, wow. and then year two, you know, it caught the attention of more people. So like year two, we had like about 220 people raised 600 grand. And then year three is just gone. We had like 300 and something people and like raised like 800 grand. That is wild. And it's um, <laughs> quick as thieves. Quick as thieves, yeah, which is brilliant. Playing. Yeah, who, who came up with that? That was <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're, we're, we're really lucky. We got like, I mean, Pioneer, the, the DJ equipment, their biggest uh, know, yeah. DJ equipment provider, they, they got behind us and they said they loved what they were doing. So give us incredible sponsorship and like loads, of, because it was completely aimed at the electronic music community, gave us incredible like prizes for the best fundraiser. Like the best fundraiser like literally walked away with 15 grand's worth of Pioneer equipment. Oh, yeah. Carl Cox got involved. Carl's like our ambassador and he, he just, Carl actually has had the cataract surgery done on his eyes that the Fred Hollows perform in third world country. So, Carl's full-time studio engineer is this guy called Chris, who I'm mates with, and Chris started doing the run and um, lost loads of weight and had this huge health turnaround. So Carl hit me up and said, look, Mike, if you need any help, and I was like, well, Carl, like, everybody knows who you are. Will you just give us a bit of help promoting? And he, you know, kind of went out in the socials and said, like, helped us raise, like, a significant amount of money and then came on the day and presented everybody with their medals. And, oh, you know, you've got all these guys, like, you know, young DJs and they cross the finish line Carl Cox hanging the medal over their head they're, 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 they're just blown away with it you know so yeah Carl all three years Carl's been like our ambassador and just like loves loves the project loves what we're doing actually s says he's going to give it a crack next time around he's going to get yeah. involved because we've, we've got a 10k and he's like uh, during, during the lockdown um, no 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 peak yeah, <laughs> <laughs> What's yeah. Sorry, Mike, I saw his eyes yeah, light yeah, up yeah, on yeah. but um yeah look, during the lockdowns i actually me and carl were going out doing a bit of exercise and training together so he said he's, he's going to give it a crack next time around he, he wants to do the 21k yeah the 21 Oof. yeah all right yeah. that is so man that is the craziest story yeah yeah it's crazy yeah it's yeah i mean yeah, it's, it's crazy for me ben because i'm like like le like legitimately i'm not talking this up when i when i was at school in my class i was like the worst runner i was always left behind and like now i've become like this this kind of running guy and it's <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's not through it's not through I don't, I don't know how i got to this point you know yeah uh, you just keep showing up with it's running, just, you know what's crazy as well and 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 you can see it from an outside looking in with the thickest these family. You got you've just built like this crazy community that when you want to do something, people just support you, Mike. And yeah, like I mean, look, it's, it's not people want to support me, Ben. I think it's people want to support what we do and what we're about, and you know they can see we've got a there's a greater purpose to what you do. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You know, like um, yeah, definitely. You know, people know that we're you know we're. Uh, I mean, anybody walks in our office door, they know that like a, a big. Uh, part of our ethos of the company is to always give back, you know? So, I mean, you know, I, I, I believe the universe being very good to me over the years and it's just like, it's just something that it, I'll, I'll continue to do as long as I can keep doing it, you know? 
mate. I've got to ask about mm-hmm. one thing when we were doing the research. <laughs> Actually, I, th- I think I remember when it happened. You ran a mi- well, you know, in in support of Fred Hollows, you ran one of the marathons blindfolded. Yeah, yeah, that's so, right. So yeah. you got to tell us about whose idea that was and, and, yeah, and well, how that played out. Yeah, it was my own idea actually. So um, when I I'd hit a certain milestone with the fundraising, I think it was like five hundred grand, and Fred Hollows said to me, Mike, we want to send you to um, with with some of our doctors just so you can see firsthand where this money is going. And I actually shot the idea down. I said, like, not one dollar of the Fred Hall's money will ever be spent sending me anywhere. So Jess, who I was telling you about, she kind of went behind my back and went to Fred Hollows and said, I've got a way around this. Um, It's Mike's 40th birthday coming up. Me and the other staff are going to chip in and buy his ticket and buy his hotels. You just take him with you wherever he goes in Cambodia. So that's what they got me for my 40th birthday present. Yeah. That's and um, I spent a week in Cambodia traveling with the Fred Hollows doctors and, and their team and, and seeing what they do. And it just absolutely blew my mind. There, there was like, I mean, so you go to Cambodia. Cambodia is just coming out, you know, for years it had a civil war and, and the country's riddled with landmines. So we, we were going to these like, these small rural towns. So the Fred Hollows doctors, what they would do is, they would send a team out a day in advance before the doctors get there and they would just find a building. And some of these buildings had been bombed because of the war. But on one particular day, I, I went there. There was there was a school that had like, there was a couple of rooms still intact, but like it, it had been bombed as well. You could see there just, you know, rubble everywhere. They'd just gone in. They set up this like makeshift, like basically eye surgery. And they had um they had sent then sent people all around to the local villages saying... Fred Hollow's doctors will be here um, tomorrow. If you if you if you're blind, come down here. And they had uh, I sat in this room all day, and they had these these doctors just and it was just like this military precision operation. They had these three beds, so all these people were lined up to get this eye surgery done. A, a huge amount of them had had limbs blown off because it stepped on landmines over the years. So they're like. You know, like, I mean, I heard your guys, um, your podcast with, with DJ Hookie. Yeah. But, you know, like a lot of these people, like they've got like literally a wooden stick for their legs and their arms have blown off. And on top of that, they're going blind just from bad hygiene, from cataracts disease. The Fred Hollows doctors would just take them in, they'd lie them on this one bed and they'd spray this anesthetic on their eye and it would numb their eye and they would leave them there for 15 minutes. Then it would like... They'd move them over to the next bed, and once they're, once the outside of their eye was like anesthetized, they would inject this big needle right into the center of their eyeball, and it would just numb the whole side of their head, and or sometimes both sides if they had to get both eyes done. And then they'd move them over to a third table, and they would just like the doctor was literally like with a scalpel, slicing their eyeball open, a fish hook pulling out this cataract, and then replacing it with this little inocular lens. And then they put a put a patch over them, and some of these people were coming in completely blind. And one of the most moving experiences I've ever had in my life was the next day, they keep them in overnight, and the next day you're you're going and, and like I took I took the eye patches off some people, and it was the first time seeing for like 20 years, oh, and it's just like you can't even describe, you know, like they're you know they're they're just like they're, and 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 it's this operation with us, and they put this inocular lens. It costs 25 bucks, and these people go from having like literally could be 95 percent blind to absolutely perfect vision just in, wow. in, in one go wow. so credit to yourself that like what peter mentioned at the start there's over you know circa hundred thousand people that you've helped yeah on well, the back it, of what, sorry and, on the back of what you've done yeah, and, yeah. and the support that everyone else, else has yeah. shown I, i'm, I'm very like I, I haven't raised all this money myself it's like i've just been able to harness a community of people mm. to kind of do it you know and you know, all the DJs that have given up their time and all, you know, the staff and everything else, you know, it's, um, yeah. But it started when you were 18 at school and yeah. you saw that kid. Mm. Yeah. That, and, a moment uh, and, in time. And, you know, so a moment life. in time. This it sounds like there's been a few when you w- yeah. walked in and Boogs was on the yeah, desk. Right. On the decks just that's, here. That's right. 20 that's years right. ago. Yeah. And then, but that's, yeah. That, how, that. how powerful that kid in the hallway though. Look, yeah. Yeah. Look what he started. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Do you remember his fire, name yeah. or any no, of that? No, I, I don't. I don't. No, but, um. But yeah, like, but getting Imagine back, he was a DJ. I know, I know. <laughs> Crazy. But getting back, Ben, to what you asked me, so I, I, I went to Cambodia, but in one of the other days on that trip, I went out to one of the rural towns with the Fred Hollows community, and um, the one thing I noticed was, like, a lot of the people who are blinded by cataracts disease, especially old people, that they literally just get shoved into the corner of these huts, and 
they're, they're just sat there, you know, and sometimes their children will have to give up give up going to school to look after them so that creates this resentment and it creates this whole mental yeah. health battle as well um and i remember one day this old man saying you know i went in and introduced myself and threw on a uh, translator and he, he turned around and said hey mate would you mind taking me for a walk and i was like what and he just said can i just hold on to your arm and can we go for a walk and we we're out going for a walk and he just he was holding on to my arm and he said do you mind if we go for a run and i was like yeah, yeah, no worries. And I just picked up the pace a little bit and I had a jog. And he said, oh, man, that was so good. I haven't run forever. And I got this just real, like, just wow. feeling how how much we don't take stuff like that for granted. Right. And I thought how, how difficult it would be. Uh, it must be for something as simple as to go for a run. So when I did the, the blindfolded run, I was just kept trying to highlight the, the, the challenges and the difficulties of blind people. And did and, you and have someone linking? You had yeah. so different people stepping in, linking arms. Yeah. And so, so, so I, I'm I'm part of this organization called the Achilles Group, and what it is is every Sunday morning, um, we meet up at the at the tan and the Achilles I organization. Saw him the other day. <laughs> huh? I saw them running around the other oh, day. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we um we basically take people with impaired vision or blind runners out for a run every Sunday morning. Um, so like yeah, like I you know I do that every most Sundays now. Um, I've been doing it for a couple of years, but. I, I just basically kind of tried to, um, see, I guess, yeah. highlight put, 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 put myself in that position of what it's like for a blind runner. And, you know, like it, it was it was a really interesting kind of experiment, you know, because like, you know, there's obviously the, the not the not seeing part. But, you know, like the first time I tried to run blindfolded because I had to train up to do to do it. You know, it wasn't just like I just didn't give it a crack on the day. <laughs> you know, I was trying to build up distance. But, you, you, you know, you get really dizzy and really disoriented and. You know, I've like one day I was out practicing and I was with with a guide and he was like he was like quite a small guy, and he, and he ran me in like he didn't he didn't think about it but I cracked my head on a branch because I was a bit taller than he was and I tri tri tripped over a few signs and you know tripped over tree roots and like you know all all these challenges that people with impaired vision actually face that you you just don't even think about so the goal was just to try and highlight um, some of the challenges that people with impaired vision have and. Yeah, luckily I did it. I got across the finish line, but yeah, it was it was, it was it was a hard thing to do. Mark, man, you've done some amazing stuff, and I think, like Benny and Marcus alluded to, when you put your mind to it and you and you create a purpose, people get around you, mate. Like that's that's a superpower, isn't it? Yeah, it is oh, a that's, superpower. Hundred percent superpower. Crazy. And yeah. you know, in a foreign country, I, I imagine you you consider Australia home now. Yeah. And we probably, you know, we rightly so claim you as an Aussie, <laughs> but. You know, to move, I lived over in, I moved to England like a lot of Aussies do and we yeah. did a couple of years over there and threw some parties when I was yeah, there good as on well. You, you know, similar kind of experience yeah. over there when I met a dude and yeah. all that kind of stuff, man. But yeah, you've done all of this. You came over with, you know, your bag on your back yeah, and, and yeah. that was it. And, and now you... Yeah, yeah I have no idea what was ahead of me. And like, you know, it's look, as, as I said, like the universe has been very good to me for the way, like I've got a, I've got a business and a job. I mean... I went to uni, I studied like, my degree was applied chemistry and my postgraduate <laughs> was software engineering and I was working in a bank for a year and I, right. just, I just, just kind of hated it. And like, <laughs> if somebody said to me like, at that point, in 10 years or 20 years from now, you'll be, you'll be a promoter in Melbourne, I would have just been like, lock him up and throw away the key. You know, what's this guy talking about? It is but, a crazy, yeah, crazy, but, crazy story, man. Yeah. And not just a promoter in Melbourne, man. Yeah. One of the legendary no, promoters that, in Melbourne, hundred percent. Well, that's a fact. Like it's you know, yeah, anyone I, out there listening that has any idea about thick as thieves, man, knows that it's it's an institute. Not just revolvers, not just an institution. Yeah. Thick, thick as thieves is an institution. Well, as well, well I think I think revolver and thick as thieves were like we've we've got such a strong history together, you know, and like. Uh, you know, I started, I, I did the very first Sunday night party here. The Sundays are really like an institutional That's day. True. And I did the first Sunday night party here in 2008. And we've just created this incredible relationship, you know, Thick as Thieves and Revolver. And we, you know, we do so much stuff together. And uh, I have half the Revolver staff doing this run now. <laughs> they're all they're all like, oh, fuck, here he goes again. You know, like, <laughs> half the time when we're doing events, I'm running around like recruiting people for the runs. So, uh, <laughs> Oh, awesome, Mike. Mike, mate, this is this has been amazing. We've got to segue into our oh, yes, fish tank. Yeah. Obviously, we dropped that a bit earlier on. But, yeah, keen to get your thoughts on uh, Brucey's segment here. Roll the clown suits, Bonnie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Zoom in, guys. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> right, so this one's come in from Benjamin Anderson. Welcome to the fish tank. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin, so he, because he, I'm a bet, so he's called himself Benjamin. Benjamin, yeah. Traditional sort of yeah. setup. Yeah. Traditional, yeah. So the business name is Adventure Hub. So my idea is a mobile app that connects outdoor enthusiasts with local guides for personalized adventure experiences. Adventure Hub app connects outdoor enthusiasts with local guides and users can book customized experiences and the app then generates revenue through commissions and additional services. Then our mission is to make the outdoors accessible and accessible and enjoyable for all. It's pretty short and sweet. Short and sweet. No, that's good though. Well done, that, Benjamin. So this is like it's a little bit of an like event. Like event. Oh right? events, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I guess I mean there's a bit to it. I think you could I'll let you boys unpack it, but yeah, I think there's there's partnerships. To oh, be had so so it's like an experience platform. It sounds that, like Red Balloon. Is that what Red Balloon is? That lady from yeah, but more Shark Tank. Than, well, yeah, that's right. Did she so that is that an experience? Web? Well, I think I think this is more the the, 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 gen, the general. Oh, that's a this is more the experience. general outdoors, and and you know, say someone turns up to Melbourne, and you know, they want to take them down to Hillsville to see the koala, like. <sighs> Maybe a bit more niche. They need to get yeah. 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 revolver. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like someone comes and they go, I want to go mountain biking or something. Some, yeah, where place do you might go? Organise the mountain bikes. Yeah. Organise mm. the transport. Organise that. Organise that. And they're, and how they clip in, they're clipping their ticket by on the bookings and stuff. Yeah, they must be. Yeah, that's what it sounds like, I guess. Booking the bus, booking the bikes, booking all that. And it sounds like, you know, using using Mike's strategy. Well, that's right. You've got, I've got Pioneer sponsoring, so getting some big brands in some of the Kathmandu's or whatever of the world. Mm. Pat- Patagonia? Is that involved? a... Involved, yeah. And the app, and as you're scrolling through the app, you sort of, it's sort of motiv- what about the expert let's see what the experts got motivating to say. you to go i might do that i might do that i might do that yeah what, true. what do you think yeah like, good concept i mean i'm curious how, like how would they monetize it like what, what what's the what's the yeah i've s- mm. Cause cause figure that one out Benjamin. yeah, yeah. <laughs> would it be like uber where they sit in the middle and kind of have a platform mm. and take a commission or yeah so they're the booking they they're almost charge. like the booking agent yeah. right so it's a two-sided marketplace yeah. where they've got People come into the app to find the experience and then people that have got the experience are then putting it on the app. Yeah, so I think, yeah, they, they're so taking, maybe a, yeah, so it's almost like a platform. They're taking revenue from, uh, sorry, they, they create fee, revenue so by taking commission for, from each booking. Yeah, so that's yeah. A t- it's going to be tough. I don't know, Mike, what do you reckon? Uh, that's, I reckon it'll be tough as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reckon that's uh. tough, man. Yeah, any, like, from what I've learned or understood... Two-sided marketplaces are really tough, man. Yeah, like it's hard to mm. build a single-sided marketplace, yeah. let alone a, a, a two-sided one. Where at the same time you've got to have people in the app that want the experience, but also have people willing to be in there and create the experience. And if mm. if one's not booking the experience, they fall off. And if they come for the experience and there's not enough experiences there, so it's is um Uber Eats or or Uber a two-sided marketplace? Yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously it can work, but it I know can, I'm yeah. not saying here to say everything you do is bloody tough. So it's, <laughs> yeah, that is, that's um, a good but, point. But it'd, it'd need to need to be Uber, and you'd need. To, and I reckon the key would be to try and bridge the gap between the two side of marketplace. You'd need to build partnerships, man. I reckon you'd need to launch need with to some launch partner, with committed committed experiences, committed and then partnership. You'd need to bring yeah. the other guys in and maybe a Carl Cox you know yeah there we go yeah yeah so maybe you you know what exactly the model that you've spoken about is you know you you need to get you need to get someone in like to to help promote it that'll get behind it Mm, that's it that's in the end within the industry I guess yeah 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 yeah, that's yeah interesting maybe maybe (laughs) maybe maybe what do they call it a uh, a social purpose man to, if you connect a social purpose to it, mm. then all of a sudden something you'll get with, people. Something to do with yeah, the, yeah, the greater gr- to greater purpose, like you said, Marcus. Yeah. Well, there's the master, the master of the greater purpose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then you get them all signing up. Yeah, good question. So, boys, are we are we investing or are we leaving our money under the mattress? I'm under the mattress in that one, <laughs> <laughs> Mister Mister. What, what what was that quote? The Warren Buffett quote: uh, "Never risk what you do have, and you do need for something you don't have, and you don't need." <laughs> <laughs> On the back of that, man, I'm keeping it under the mattress, yeah. dude. Yeah, I'm going to stick with Mike and keep investing in property. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Safe um, as houses. Sorry, Benny. Safe as houses. Sorry, Benjamin. Benjamin, play but, uh, on, but he'll get sent a hoodie and yeah, absolutely. You know, no, that was good, for- good submission. So if you uh, if you've got your best uh, business idea, send it into pitch at littlefishpodcast.com. We're sort of we want that that fifty words or less. Um, so and, and if you get selected, if you get read out, Benny will send you some crispy merch. 
Hundred percent, hundred percent, and it seems to be a thing, right? Because we're getting them; they're flowing in. That's so, they come in. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so if that's an indication, <laughs> we just need them to roll off the tongue a bit better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the challenge. That's all right. No, that's good. Hey, Mike, this has been amazing, mate. Is there anything, anything we've missed? Anything you want to talk about? Nah. Want to drop? Like you're doing some really exciting stuff. It's what? actually getting me a bit excited. Yeah, yeah I'm man. Thinking like. Yeah. Well, no. I was going to say the next quickest thing is because PK's in. I'm signing him yeah, up. Yeah. Marcus will be, be in. There. And I'll be, I'll, I'll be, I'll I'll be next to it, Carl man. on the. I'll, I'll, I'll hold the medals for Carl to then take off me to give to the people. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> when is it? We've got a bit of time. Uh, we're, we're actually doing, we're doing May next year. Um, oh, yeah. Sounds uh, all right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for the last three years, we've done November, but I found um, the year just gone, there was just this like, you know, it was the first year travel opened up. So like during the time period when we were doing the bulk of the training, which was like July, August, September, everybody was in Europe. Mm. And then, yeah. and then as well as that, we, you know, we had a pretty shitty um, winter last year and like, like no offense boys, but I've just, I've got a feeling that some of the Aussies are a bit soft with the weather. Cause, <laughs> oh, yeah. cause, cause I was like, That's a fact. We, 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 have, we have, we have all these WhatsApp groups that we organize training and the amount of nights that I'd be like, right, who, who's going training? You'd have like 18 hands up and then you wake up in the morning, it's like blowing a gale and raining. And you'd be like me and one other person running around the lake and like in the dark, you know? So now we, I decided, um, the first year when we were doing the, the coast wreck event for Fred Hall was, it was in May and it was always a great time because like everybody's just like, eaten and drank their own body weight <laughs> in, in, in the month of December. Yeah. So like coming out of New Year, it's always a great time to start a health kick. Everybody's committed. Yeah. You're training in the good weather. So yeah, May 2024, we'll be back. Oh, you know what we should That's do? Awesome, we should, we, maybe we do a live pod from out there, mate. We may might do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I reckon 100%. what we do... And, and get Bruce dudes coming run it. across the line. Yeah, yeah that's it. That's well, it. Pod, he's on the, on the bike behind <laughs> yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The microphone. Spiz, you, you'll come onto the pod, mate. We'll get you. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be running. Oh, I don't know if my hips can handle the run. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Plenty of time, PK. You'll be right. Right. This has been epic, man. Thank you so much for uh, oh, guys, yeah, thanks organizing for having it. me on. I appreciate time, it. Man. Shout out you to guys Revolver some, as well. Yeah, 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 totally. Legends. Yeah, Revolver. But no, like the quality of guests you got is just mind-blowing. So I was uh, honored to get the call up. Oh, mate. You're, you're right, at the top you. of the this list. Is, yeah, yeah. It's an honor to have you, man, at the top of the list. I don't like Nathan Buckley. would be too happy to hear that. And I was telling the wife, I was have a guess where I'm going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> See you so, next week. It's all no. above board, Joe. It's all good. I'll be yeah. home. <laughs> At normal time. Nah, Mike, it's been really good, mate. And keep up the keep up the great work. We'll be following intently, and, yeah. and I reckon we'll probably yeah, we'll drop some links for quickest thieves. Fantastic. We'll drop some links for Fred Hollows as well, man. Yeah, great. And I read somewhere, which is a fact as well. It's not just the money that you've raised for Fred Hollows. That's the, the that's the exponential. Thing well, well, the, well, the, 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 the donators are like life, as the stats tell us, they're that, lifelong. They're that, that's right. And like a lot of these, like one of the things with something like an eyesight um, issue with cataracts disease is it tends not to happen to people until they're older. So therefore, it's hard to get young people to connect with that. Mm. Most people who end up supporting Fred Hollows only realize the impact it has when they're in their like 60s because that's generally the age. If you're in Australia that you'll develop cataracts, but yeah. when you're overseas, you can develop it a lot younger. So just getting young people aware that this is, you know, we're, we're very privileged in this country that we can, you know, we, we have like, we don't have hygiene issues and stuff that can lead to cataracts while you're younger. And generally when people get involved and start following a charity, they tend to follow it through the course of their life unless, you know, something... You know, you hear these stories about charities where the money goes. They're missing. driving Lambos. Yeah, we see you rock up in the Lambo. <laughs> I, 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 honestly, Ben, I've heard like some of the stories. Uh, you know, Fred Hollows is consistently in one of in the top five charities, not only in Australia but in the world for the amount of money that's donated versus what makes it on the field. That they, mm. they they get audited by Deloitte and Touche every year, and they run their whole operation. I, I, I think it's like ten percent. So there's 90% of the money is on the field changing people's lives. So, and that was a big thing that drew me to Fred Hollows in the first place as well, you know? So when you give money to Fred Hollows, you, you know, like it's, it's having an impact. And, go, and getting them in early, man. So then they become Fred Hollows that, supporters. Right. Yeah, and yeah, that's and right. once you get the young kids and it becomes cool. That's and right. man, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, that's the exponential stuff, that's right? right? That's because right. Because the money keeps coming. Yeah. Oh, life, lifetime, life, clients. lifetime clients. That's right. Man. 
That's right. The most. Lifetime value. Mate, keep up the great work. Love Thanks it. very much for having us, guys. Thanks, really Mike. good fun. Legend. Chat 100%. to you soon. We'll Please. see you Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> you guys coming with me or are you staying? <laughs> Please <laughs> like, share, subscribe. Uh, please comment, get involved, share that with anyone yeah, who's darkened the doors down here on Chapel Street. Yeah. See you at the top. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, fellas. <laughs> Part of a winning team. People can find a better version of themselves. If they choose. Hmm. You just need to go start some shit. Action is all that matters. Be a man of your word. I think I look back now and I'm like, whoa, that took some guts. Be kind. Be kind. Be kind. See you at the top. New episode every Wednesday. <laughs>